Thank you so much, Barbara. And I want to thank the Prevention Council for having me. And uh, uh, Angelo, thank you for coming. And um, uh, Dean Campbell for, for uh, welcoming us. And Dr. Nathan for uh, what I think will be a uh, lively uh, discussion. Uh, Okay, all right, there we go. I'm never been accused of being having a soft voice, so you could probably hear me without this, but um, and, and I think we'll have a good good conversation. You know, I, I think uh, Dean Campbell was right when he's talked about how this is an issue that uh, is sometimes difficult to discuss, I think for a lot of reasons. Um, it, it's sort of one that, that it does elicit a lot, a lot of emotion on, on both sides. I think part of that is sort of some latent PTSD that uh, as an American people we have about whatever the government tells us about drugs, right? Um, absolutely a hundred years ago uh, the exaggerations and really kind of things I think I don't think we'd be proud of that were talked about with marijuana in the early 1900s, uh, you know, are, if you look at the history it's not something that anybody in here, you know, in court included law enforcement would be, would be proud of. And I think that a lot of people still have this idea of reefer madness when they hear any harms that might be presented about marijuana because they think that, well, you know, the science doesn't meet um, the criteria for, for having any, you know, worry about it. I think the irony with that is that actually as we've learned more about marijuana and today's marijuana, okay, this isn't the marijuana from the days of, of Thomas Jefferson cultivating hemp. Okay, let's just be very clear. We're talking about the THC levels that have you know, gone 10 to 20 times anything even 25 years ago, let alone 200 years ago when there was an obscure plant called cannabis that we called hemp that was cultivated for, for fiber and rope until we found, uh, frankly, better uh, uh, uses uh, for, for other crops that would take over from hemp. Uh, and it certainly isn't the same plant 2,000 years ago discussed in China or ancient Egypt, okay? So I think a lot of people have sort of some misconceptions based on even very recent past um, that make it difficult to have. I also think that, you know, and this is kind of the, the theme, and I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about the organization that, that uh, Patrick and I started. I will just say, though, that you now have uh, the founders of this organization are now both residents of New Jersey, which wasn't the case when we founded the organization. So I don't know what that says. But, and I'm a resident of Mercer County, which is amazing because it mean, meant that I didn't have to get on a plane or a train to get here. I drove seven minutes. So that's wonderful. Thank you for being so close. Um, and Patrick isn't as close. He's in Brigantine, but uh, and actually today he's up in D.C. on mental illness issues. And, I, and as all of you know, Congressman Kennedy has dedicated his life to the issue of mental health. Um, you know, he got Congress to agree on something that I know you're going to be so proud of your elected officials when you hear the crazy thing that he got them to agree on. And that thing was that the brain is part of the body. <laughs> it's shocking. But, um, but really, that's actually what he got them to agree on. Because for so long, our mental illness was treated differently than our physical illnesses. As if, if it happened from the neck down, we were really worried. But actually, the checkup from the neck up wasn't something we were concerned about as a country. And um, so he's actually up there today talking about how the criminal justice system has unfortunately, and by the way, law enforcement is the first group that tells us this, the criminal justice system has been the default mental health system in this country, right? And um, we have to change that. And so what's interesting is that when this whole discussion of marijuana was coming about, and people were sort of surprised, well, wait a minute, you have the son of the liberal lion of the Senate coming out against legalization? How does that make sense? And it actually makes a lot of sense because when you think about it in the realm of mental health and sort of overall health, the idea that we would want to have um, really another substance that hurts mental health more widely available and cheaper. And, and this is the thesis really of what I'm talking about today. If you don't remember anything else of what I'm going to say, remember this. A substance that's going to be widely commercialized and promoted by a new tobacco-like industry that we need to be concerned about. It. And that really is what I'm, what I'm here to talk about today. And so we saw that there was this false dichotomy out there. And I think this is one of the reasons you can't have a, often a decent conversation about this issue, a civilized one. Because you have to be, society wants to put us in two camps. You're either for legalization or you're for throwing everyone in prison. Which one? 
And we sort of, you know, I worked in three White Houses, unfortunately, no matter which party you're working with, everybody wants policies to fit on a bumper sticker. And real policy that works kind of doesn't really fit on a bumper sticker. Or if it does, I mean, you've had a brilliant PR person teach you how to do that. But the reality is that public policy is complicated. And so when we're presented with this idea of legalization or prohibition, um, this was something that bothered Patrick and I, and it also bothered the heads of most major medical associations who found themselves not in favor of legalization, but also not in favor of locking people up and giving them a criminal record if they had a joint in their pocket. And so we said, can't we find a better way to deal with this? And so the bulk of my discussion today is going to be about why this, this, this sort of talk in this country about legalization I think is dangerous. But um, we can't, you know, sort of brush aside so easily the fact that we do need to reform our criminal justice system. You know, saying that legalization is a problem doesn't mean everything is hunky-dory with our criminal justice system. And for too long, that's kind of been the implication. That if you were against legalization and talked about how our criminal justice system may not be perfect, that somehow you were showing weakness or somehow you were showing flimsiness on this issue. And actually, we're very, very adamant that, that it's in fact the opposite. That actually, if you're not able to, uh, you know, discuss some of the core issues uh, that are in our system, you know, in an intelligent way, then you're really not doing a service to public health or public safety. You know, we have seven million people in the criminal justice system in this country right now. It's five times more than our historical average. It's also five times more the, of the um, average of uh, the major industrialized countries of the world. Okay, now. I don't think anyone's proud of that, but, but the issue is how do we make that, how do we reduce that number, but also increase efficiency in the system? Because many of you might know this, but five out of seven people in our system are not behind bars. I mean, if you're only concerned with who's actually behind bars, you're not talking about the system. Five million out of seven million are in our community. They're on probation and parole. And our probation system is broken in this country. We have way, you know, huge high caseloads. We don't have enough mental health treatment. We don't have enough drug treatment. And so we're trying to talk about, let's start there in terms of, you want to reform our criminal justice system. Let's start with, you know, community corrections. Let's start with some of the sentencing that's probably gone overboard. And let's do things that, frankly, the prosecutor talked about just now, things like the conditional discharge, where you have record expungement, you have treatment options, you have, um, you know, uh, 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 other early intervention options, you have mental health, whole health, you know, looking at sort of a person, you have housing, looking at housing, looking at education, etc. And those are frankly a lot harder to do than just saying, you know what, we want to legalize marijuana because we're worried about our criminal justice system. And frankly, I think that's a, that's a cop out. It's a lot easier to do. It's a lot harder to say, what are the within the seven million you know, people in our system, how do we reform what's going on? And uh, that's very complicated because it means that, you know, you have to sort of start doing things in a very different way. Um, there was once, a, most of you may know what a drug court is. You have, you have them in New Jersey. They're basically specialized courts that you send people that have a drug-related crime, right, that needs to be really dealt with in treatment, but you can't forget the criminal justice aspect because they happen to commit a crime Right, either while they were on drugs or in concordant with their drug charge. So you can't just say, well, you know, he mugged somebody, but he also was on drugs, so he should just get treatment. You kind of have to do both. So a drug court sort of brings those things together. And I love the evaluation of the DC drug court from about 15 years ago. This, this put it well, and I don't know if we have any judges in the room, so I don't want to offend anybody, but basically it said, yeah, the DC drug court evaluation, the evaluator said, you know what, the, the drug court worked. And what we learned was it's actually a lot easier than we thought to change criminal behavior. You know, if you offer treatment and the things that are, but you know, it's awful hard to change judge behavior. And that's part of what this is about is sometimes it's sort of needing to talk about this in a new way and that takes some time. But the idea that we instead say, you know what, we're not gonna do that hard work. And instead what we're gonna do is just say we should legalize marijuana to help people so they don't get involved in the criminal justice system, I think is not only, again, sort of a cop-out, but it's also um, it's sort of going to have the opposite effect of what you're thinking. What's the number one drug that is dealt with in the criminal justice system? I mean, I'm not even talking about for violence-related. I'm talking about things like 
uh, and, and the, you can't, the prosecutor can't, can't, can't talk about this because it's not fair. But what's the number one drug in our criminal justice system for non-violent things like using while intoxicated? 800,000 arrests a year, just for public intoxication. Alcohol. Alcohol. About another million for driving while intoxicated, and another 600,000 violations for selling to minors. Not even talking about the murder, rape, robbery, everything else connected to it, just the nonviolent stuff. And so when I look at alcohol, I say, wait a minute, our legal drugs are actually the drivers of the criminal justice system, maybe more than our illegal ones. Doesn't mean that we forget about wanting to correct laws that don't make sense, like a mandatory minimum for crack, 10 times more than cocaine. I, I opposed that for a long time. And in the Obama administration, we sort of worked with Congress and fixed it a little bit, but not fully. But my point is, when you look at the bigger impact and you see the impacts of legal drugs, it's sort of thinking, wait a minute, how has that helped the criminal justice system to have something legally available, cheap, and commercialized by a profitable, powerful, addictive industry? There were 15 lobbyists for the alcohol industry in Washington the last time I was there for every member of Congress. So if you think that you can defeat the special interest lobbying machine that our country has perfected with some kind of perfect sort of legalization that controls and regulates and taxes and takes it out of the hands of criminals as we hear all the time, that is not the reality of how policy is working in this country. And that's our legal drugs. And now let's talk about social justice for a minute because we can't ignore about things that are going on just a few hours, I remember where I am in New Jersey right now, to two hours south of us, right? And so when we look at a city like Baltimore, and we actually see that there are eight times, eight times, let this sink in, as many liquor stores in poor communities of color than there are in richer communities. Is it any different in Trenton? Is it? No, because I didn't look at those stats, but it's not, I guess it's not different. I didn't think so. And it's the same in LA, and it's the same in Chicago, and it's the same in New York. And so when I look at the impact of legal drugs on social justice, then I then say, well, wait a minute. Does it really make sense to just, you know, free the weed and let people do what they want and, you know, legalize it and so-called regulate it? You know, I really could care less if you're an adult smoking a joint in the basement of your own house. Now, I don't know if they're, I'm not speaking for everybody in this room, but, but I, that, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not making a moral judgment on the 50-year-old guy who wants to smoke a joint a, you know, a few times a month in his basement. That is not the issue. And I'm, by the way, I'm not making a moral judgment on anybody. My issue is not about the, you know, the individual user. My issue is about what is going to be created if we continue down this path of legalization. That's my issue. So my issue is about creating the next alcohol. The next you know, uh, tobacco. Okay. And by the way, the next gambling industry. I don't know if anybody's here from Atlantic City. How's that going? Revitalize the community? It was supposed to bring you the, uh, tons of tax revenue. What happened? Are they the best schools in the state in Atlantic City? So when we hear these promises, we need to just think about it for a minute and not fall into this trap, right, of either or. You know, legalization over here, incarceration over there. Um, so this is what I'm worried about. So when I talk about the alcohol analogy and gambling, the real analogy is big tobacco, folks. You know, for a hundred years, we had an industry in this country that lied through their teeth. We'd be crying if we weren't laughing right now, actually, to the American people about the harm of smoke. What did they say? Well, they said a couple things that may sound a little familiar, right? They said, this is only for adults, first of all. We're not targeting kids. Okay, well, why do you have candy cigarettes? Well, you know, that, there was no answer. Okay? Um, this is only for adults, is what we're... This is... Uh, we're not sure what the real effects of smoking are. The, really, the science isn't in yet. Do you know that as late as 1999, members of Congress told the Congressional Committee that tobacco wasn't addictive? I mean, it's hilarious. Again, if we're not crying, we're laughing. And, you know, the, I, I, I know that the people under of which there are a lot of them under 22 or 23 in this room. You don't remember when your community had, you know, uh, cigarette vending machines, you know, on every street corner. That's like, you don't remember when people were smoking on a plane and when it was so radical 
for the American Medical Student Association, it was the students actually, who said in the in 80s, I believe, early 80s, they said, you know, smoking on planes probably isn't really a good idea. <laughs> People thought they were crazy, really, all oh, those crazy students again. You, were, you weren't even born, I don't know if you were, you weren't even conceived, okay, when that was going on. So I think also for, and I'm gonna pretend that you know, millennials are 18 to 35 supposedly, so I'm like, right on that border, so I'm going to categorize myself with you guys, okay? So when we, you know, our generation, right, doesn't actually, didn't live through that nightmare, right? You didn't live through, you know, having to tell your kids, well, you know, we want to watch sports, we want to watch this or that, but ignore those ads. Well, we are sort of with alcohol now, but with, with, with tobacco, you, you don't know that. You didn't live through the when you could publicly smoke everywhere, smoking or non-smoking section. You didn't live it. It's not really, maybe something you remember from when you were very little, but if that. So I think a lot of the millennials that say, you know what, let's just legalize pot because, you know, we just want to smoke it and it's not that bad and whatever, really are saying it from having zero experience with what this country looks like when you have a legalized, powerful, addictive industry. Although, let's just remind ourselves about one more industry I haven't mentioned yet which you do know about. And that's an industry that's supposedly highly regulated, run by professionals. In fact, you have to have a million dollar education to be able to be the gatekeeper of this industry. You don't just have to have a slick FDA, you know, like, and you know what that is? That's prescription drugs, right? Remember those? I mean, remember, you, you're technically not even allowed. You can't even buy that at a, you know, do you have any, I know they want medical marijuana dispensaries, do you have any like Oxycontin dispensaries around? No. So you, you well yes, they're called CVS. But, but the point is, the point is, um, you don't have those separate stores that sell them and advertise them, but we have them mainstreamed in supposedly professional medicine. And yet, the United States consumes 94% of the world's pain pills. And I get that we might have like a little more pain than most countries, but probably not, not so much more than our, you know, brethren in some of the other probably more difficult countries to live in. So when I think about legalization, that's what I think of. I don't, I'm not here to cheerlead about just say no and you are going to become a heroin addict if you try pop today. Or, you know, you are going to, you know, get lung cancer if you start smoking marijuana. Or you are going to this and that. I'm not here to do that. And you know what? Frankly, you shouldn't take my word for it even if I was up here to do that. You should do your own research. And I don't mean, you know, Google. I don't mean the message boards of, you know, Reddit. I mean the American Society of Addiction Medicine. The American Medical Association. The Journal of American Public Health. You know, I get that this is a crowd here that is, has a specialized interest. I mean, you're listening to a guy talk about marijuana on a beautiful day, you know, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. What are we doing here? You know, it's like, gosh, but you're, you're very motivated, which is awesome. But even still, I have a feeling next to your bedside isn't the 4,000-page uh, <laughs> annals of the American Medical Association that you read for some quiet bedside reading. Or, am I wrong? Anybody here do that? I don't think you're hanging out at the conference of the American Society of Addiction Medicine uh, uh, that happened in Austin. Did I miss anybody who was, might have been there this year? So do you think that the rest of the American people are doing that? Like the average American tonight is like, I really, you know, there's this fascinating article in Lancet Psychiatry that came out last week. <laughs> we gotta check that out and read the end value to see what the significant factor was and to see if it's anything we need to remember. No, we're getting our knowledge from sloppy headlines from, frankly, places like CNN. And I'm not really blaming CNN. I can also blame Fox News. But we're getting stuff from sloppy headlines. We're getting our stuff from Google searches of what some guy who really likes to vape wrote on a message board last year. And we're saying, wow, that's like the right way. We're not getting our information from the right sources. And I think we are absolutely playing right into the hands of this industry. That is copying every single thing that the tobacco industry did. They are undermining public health. They are forming their own groups. They have political special interest lobbying groups in Washington, D.C. And they are very proud of it. I mean, this isn't just something they're hiding. This isn't like, you know, so, no, this is like, we're yeah, we're here to, and, and, and 
they, they're not the peace-loving hippies that my parents always talk about that hung out at Woodstock. Um, they're the Yale MBAs that look like me, that are a lot smoother and slicker than me and know how to make the craziest, most awesome PowerPoint you've ever seen in your life and, and know these facts from off the top of their head because they see this as their green moment. I don't mean pot green, I mean money green. So if you're not going to you know, remember anything else from today, it's that this is about one thing and that's money. That is what this whole movement is about. It doesn't mean that there aren't you know, well-meaning people who think that for they've carefully weighed the pros and cons, and we may talk to some of them today, and they thought, you know, after weighing the pros and cons, we've decided that, you know, it, it, let's try a carefully regulated system. Absolutely, there are people like that out there. And I'm talking with them all the time. Some of them are my professors, former professors. They don't want to see big tobacco. And I, absolutely, there are some well-meaning people out there. But my argument about that is that's kind of irrelevant. Because the industry, when they're passing a law in Colorado like they did three or four years ago, three years ago, when they're trying to come here and pass laws or come, they're not necessarily going to always be, they might put them on a committee or have a, in California they have this blue ribbon panel that's going to come up with the best kind of marijuana legalization law that you know has recommendations from all across the country from public health. And it sounds really great until you see how it's basically going to be trashed the day that it comes out because the industry that's actually writing the law in California, if they wrote the law that the guys who are the academics wanted them to write, but was carefully constructed, regulated, tax, they wouldn't make any money. So that, that's a little problem. Um, and so they're not going to write that law. And they're going to say thank you for your input and we'd love to put you on this panel and that panel and we're going to have your bio up on a really fancy website. It's going to be great. You're going to speak. That's wonderful. But at the end of the day, this is about an industry who wants to make money. And let me tell you something. Addictive industries, and I'll talk about marijuana and addiction, but even if you don't think it's addictive, which it is, but let's pretend you don't think it is. Somewhat habit forming even. It doesn't matter. The point is, any of these sort of what um, some academics call temptation goods, these industries, so alcohol, cigarettes, sugar, these are not industries that rely, make money from the casual user. So if you're the person that says, you know, yeah, let's legalize Kevin, I am going to try it. I'm going to use it once a month, once a week when I'm stressed, and that's you know, about it. I'm going to use low-grade THC. I don't want to get crazy high. What's the big deal? I'll be, I'm a taxpayer, and I want to be a criminal. The problem is the industry doesn't care about you. In other words, you're not who they're targeting because <laughs> they don't make money from you. They only make money from people who use heavily. Why? What do I mean? Think of the alcohol industry. You think they make money if you drink a glass of wine once a night for, with your dinner? Or if you drink a few beers on a weekend? Forget about it. They're making money from the 20% of all of alcohol drinkers in this country, 20%, who drink 80% of the volume of alcohol. So that's that's a fact. So 20% of all Americans who drink consume 80% of all the liquor in this country. That's your target. Not the 80% of people who actually drink responsibly, many of whom may be in this room and they're going to enjoy a drink tonight. That's not the target if you're trying to make money. And so and tobacco is the same way, pills are the same way. This is, you. if you are in this business, you have to increase use and increase the intensity of that use to make sure that it's a heavy user. You have to be promoting higher, you know, better highs. You have to be promoting things that target kids. Because by the way, kids are your best, are going to be your best long-term customers. Why? Well, um, has anybody ever met a, uh, someone with a substance use disorder, an alcoholic, that started their drug of choice after age 30? With, with the exception of, and that was probably pills, but other than for prescription pills, there's maybe one or two, that's about right, it's about 1%, right? The vast majority of us, vast, 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 vast majority of us who have a problem with drugs, including alcohol, it's a drug, which is, we legalized it a long time ago, but it's a drug. Um, the vast majority started while their brain was in development. And that means prior to age 25, 30 or so. And that's because your brain at that 
at that period is essentially under construction. And I've gone way ahead in my talk because I've gone ahead of myself here, but I want to show you um, the brain for a second. And, you know, your brain develops from the back to the front. And that makes sense, actually, right? Coordination comes, vision comes before, you know, judgment comes. That makes sense, right? A four-year-old doesn't really have good judgment. Ten-year-old, a 15-year-old doesn't have good judgment. It's because your brain is fully developed around between age 25 and 30. Okay, what does that mean? It means it's essentially under construction until then. Uh, if you know a second language, do you are you going to have a better chance of retaining that second language if you were five when you learned the language or 50? Five. Well, that's right. It's a great, you know, it's actually a great thing that your brain is under construction before because you're learning and you're, you're, you're soaking in so many things. You're taking, you can take in things that older people have a very hard time doing. Um, when you learn to ride a bike, is your mom going to say, you know what, Johnny, we're going to not teach you when you're six. We're going to wait until you're about, you're about 46. No. And that's because your, your muscle memory, all that is ripe at that age. That's absolutely, it's wonderful. But it's also, by the way, there's a flip side of that. It's why we care about things like childhood trauma, right? More than adult trauma, really, actually. It doesn't mean that adult trauma is not important. It just means that childhood trauma is much more difficult to deal with. Because things and memories and, and things that happen when you're young have the ability to stay with you your whole life. And it's very difficult. Addiction is the exact same thing. right? Addiction to anything. Now, different drugs have different effects. Well, I mean, let's be very clear. Actually, tobacco and nicotine does not affect your judgment. So, I mean, it's more addictive than heroin in terms of the reward center of the brain, right? Memory, just a, addiction, let's not get fancy. It's very simple what addiction is, folks. Addiction is you did something, you liked it, you remember that you liked it, and you're gonna do it again. <laughs> we'll just make it, make it easy. And so tobacco is actually the most addictive in terms of activating this reward and memory more than heroin, believe it or not. It's crazy. But what's interesting about tobacco, which is not the case for marijuana or heroin, is that it really actually does not affect that part of the brain. Movement, judgment, vision, coordination, right? Have you ever heard of a car accident while smoking? Well, maybe if you had one hand on the steering wheel and one hand was holding a cigarette, but probably not because you were intoxicated. Because cigarettes do not have that kind of intoxication. It's, it's actually interesting to think about it like that. But it has, again, much more damaging effects on other parts of your body, like the lungs, in a way that other drugs do not. Um, but, but this is what's happening you know, when your brain is, 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 is forming. And so what I'm worried about is right now, the number of people who have used 21 days or more in this country has increased by a factor of seven since 1992. Even though, interestingly enough, casual use, this is a high school student. So the green line, I mean, it, it's gone up since 92, absolutely, not by a factor of seven. These are high school students. Um, by the way, you notice cigarettes have gone down, and actually marijuana surpasses cigarettes. So some people say, well, wait a minute, Kevin, hold on a second. Cigarettes are legal. It's gone down. Well, what's that? Maybe, so why do we treat marijuana like cigarettes? And the answer is wonderful. If you can get the entire country against pot as much as they are against cigarettes, you'd have a deal. But right now, it's the opposite for marijuana than it is for cigarettes. What do I mean? Um, I don't even know a smoker, folks, a cigarette smoker, who is proud of their smoking. <laughs> can you find a smoker that is even wants to buy a car, a used car? that someone else has smoked it. I mean, you can't even, I don't even know where you can smoke legally these days. Seriously. If you smoke in your house, forget about it. If you have a kid or a spouse that doesn't like it, you will be kicked out in a heartbeat. If you smoke in your car, like I said, you're not selling it to anybody, including smokers. Um, so we have made this huge change. And why did we make this change? Well, we sort of learned the hard way. A hundred years, as I said, of lies and deceit by an industry is kind of how we said, you know what, uh, maybe actually this whole smoking thing wasn't a great idea. Whoops, 500,000 deaths a year for the last century. You know, do you know what we found out about the link between smoking and cancer? What do you think, 60s? Remember the Surgeon General Report? Most people think 60s or 70s, which is an educated guess. 40s. We found out about it. 40s, some of the cameramen here said 40s. You're getting a little warmer. Folks, we found out about it in the 1910s and the 1920s, the published research about it in peer-reviewed journals, not just someone's random idea that happened to be right later. 
I'm talking like verifiable research. So we've known this for a very long time, and yet we did kind of nothing about it because there was this lobby and we didn't think it was a big deal. Most Americans didn't think it was a big deal at all. That's why you could smoke in planes. We are there when it comes to marijuana right now. We're like in 1939, really, for marijuana, is where we were for cigarettes then, in terms of our thinking. And so my whole thing is maybe we should learn a little bit from the past uh, before we later say, you know, whoops, this was probably not a good idea. By the way, alcohol is used by far more than either of them combined. So uh, a factor of seven, and, and, and it has increased a lot since 2007 as well. I'm not going to go into the other things until a little bit later. Um, so, so the brain, as I said, is affected by this. Different drugs have different levels of addiction. This is 20-year-old research. It's the latest research we have on addiction rates, which I actually think is pretty horrible. That we, that we, the last bit of research on the addictiveness of marijuana comes from 1994, which actually meant that the work was done in 1992. Anybody here not even born yet in 1992? Probably some. Yeah, it's okay. I can tell. A lot of you. When this was done, that's pretty embarrassing. But anyway, what we know from that, tobacco, one in three people are addicted who ever try it. That's what that means, 32% of those who try it ever. Alcohol, this is, these are adults, by the way. 15, marijuana, 9, cannabis, and then you see the rest. Now, if you start when you're 16, that 9% of cannabis goes to 17%, right? It goes to 1 in 6. And again, that's because your brain is developing at 16. If you start at 14, it's 1 in 4. Now, what, is, again, what does that mean? Because you're going to be saying, Kevin, addiction, what are you talking about? I don't have, you know, shakes, or I'm not, like, violently withdrawing like we see with heroin users. Well, you know, People like to make the distinction between psychological and physical addiction. I have news for you. Your brain doesn't care. It doesn't know the difference. Now, you may have symptoms that are physical or psychological, right? So the marijuana withdrawal symptoms aren't going to be the crazy violent shakes and you're on the ground. And it, no, it's going to be the paranoia. It's going to be the obsession. It's going to be some of the mental health effects. So I think that's why sometimes we hear about psychological addiction. It just means the symptoms are more psychological than they are physical, right? And so because of that, because of how we've always treated mental illness, I think actually I think these are connected with what I said. We sort of discount it. We're like, well, it's not, you know, cocaine or heroin. You're not. And we did, now I'm not saying, by the way, that marijuana is equivalent at all to cocaine or heroin. Let's be very clear. There are drugs much more harmful than marijuana. That's not my, my point of this line of reasoning. What I'm saying is they have different effects. And so if I have to hear one more time that marijuana is safer than alcohol, let me just say, that is like saying to a young person, you know what? It is much safer for you to jump out of the fourth floor window than it is if you jumped out the eighth floor window. So jump out of... Now, <laughs> On its face, that's true. I mean, you know, you might survive the fourth floor versus the eighth floor. It doesn't make a lot of sense, though. But when you think about it, it's, it's another, another analogy. Is, uh, it's like saying, well, my, my, my headlights are broken. And so, you know, Kevin, because we want to be consistent, we should break the taillights, too. <laughs> Folks, alcohol is not legal because it's safer than marijuana. That's not really the argument anyway. Alcohol is legal because, well, there's kind of that little thing called historical culture, and there's that little thing called, you know, customs in Western culture that started before the Old Testament. And those are kind of hard to reverse. So when you have the, the and this is the fact, the majority of the Western population drinking since sick for at least five to 6,000 years, majority drinking, okay, not like, Marijuana is 8% right now of the American population smoke the marijuana in the last 30 days. If you look at everyone 12 and older. You, when you look at marijuana, I mean alcohol, as I showed earlier, you're, you're looking at something more like uh, the, where is it here? 52, 55, 60% here it is. Right? And by the way, tobacco, if you think we've won the war on smoking, one in four of us still use tobacco. So that war hasn't necessarily been won at all. We're still feeling the effects. But my point about alcohol is that train has sort of left the station. And so for all the harms, we tried to prohibit alcohol for about 15 years. What happened? Well, actually, is there any, alcohol use went down. Now, other problems went up. Cirrhosis of the liver, though, became no longer an issue. But there were problems, and that's why I'm not in favor of alcohol prohibition. But it's not because I think alcohol is wonderful. Because it's been, can anybody here, I, you know, I, this is, let me tell you, 
Can anybody here say with a straight face that alcohol legalization in our culture and normalization, essentially what we have now with alcohol, has been a net public health success? Like we're thinking, thank God alcohol is as available as it is right now, because we wouldn't be as healthy. <laughs> it's funny when you think of it like that. Or, or forget, I mean, forget health, look at safety, right? Can anybody say that it's been a safety success? Like, I feel much safer when everyone is drunk around me. <laughs> My community is so much safer when there are eight times as many liquor stores as there are in other communities, and when I can't find a grocery store for six miles, and when a, a school that's a, a school here has textbooks for 1971, but I'm so happy that alcohol is here. We can't say that with a straight face. So I'm not here to argue against alcohol. I'm not here to argue for alcohol prohibition. I'm simply here to say that's our model, right? Along with tobacco and prescription drugs. And when you think about alcohol, tobacco, and prescription drugs, the only question I have is, are we having fun yet? I mean, really? You want to add something? I don't care what else you're adding. Are we, are we proud and happy with that experience that we've had? Now, we're not going to go back and change the law on alcohol and do all that. We're not because, because of how this has been acculturized. But it, it's difficult to make that case. Now, I'm not going to, you know, I, I have a limited amount of time. There are other things I want to get to. But there's a lot of data that you need to look at for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Don't take anybody's up here word for it. You need to read the research yourself. When you look at the research on things like IQ, you know, I know that a lot of, student, a lot of students here, and I'm, I bet, and the dean will attest to this, that you're all certified geniuses. 150 on the IQ scale. You're all Steve Jobs. I'm sure you are. But in most places, when I talk in, this, in, in a one room, it's not going to be that. Right? So if you're the certified genius, if all, like all of you are, if I can say this, Dean, go ahead and smoke a lot of pot. It will have an IQ of 150. If you lose eight points, which is what the recent research says will happen, or could happen, significantly increase the risk, not will happen for sure. Nothing is for sure. Increased risk is what we're talking about, folks. If you're cool with that and you go down to 142, you're still a genius. So have a blast. But if you're the average student and you have an IQ of 100, I have a high school student, and you lose eight points, well, that actually means something a little bit more, right? That, that does mean the difference. That, you know, by the way, a standard deviation, and what I mean by standard deviation is average, below average, above average. Those are the deviations, okay? Eight points is an almost a standard deviation, meaning it almost takes you from average to below average. That's a very big deal. And when we're now, you know, you're all trying to be looking for jobs, I'm guessing now, some of you. Except you're all geniuses, so you've had jobs, and you're good to go. But a lot of people in your age, they're all they're going to be looking for jobs. The issue is, you know, when I think about the job situation today and how you're not competing against the guy from guys from Philly for your jobs or Manhattan, you're competing from the guys, you know, in Beijing, in Bangalore, in uh, Seoul, and when I say they're not smoking pot like we are, you may still get the job, absolutely. And plenty of people with good jobs smoke pot. I'm not here to say that they don't. But when you look at the risks and you look at what you're willing to do, and, and you know, it's like I see all these parents, and I'm, I'm guessing Mercer County is similar, spending like $20,000 on their high school kids' SAT prep and you know, resume prep and stuff like that. Seriously. And then we're going to kind of have a laissez faire attitude with this. To me, that doesn't make any sense. Again, it doesn't mean that this is going to happen for sure. It means that you increase the risk. And I think that's a lot of what, you know, when we have a lot of misconceptions, let me say this, is that you have people who say, you know what, my friend did this and he's fine. I was in a debate the other day, they said, Kevin, the last three presidents, in fact, Kevin, the three presidents you worked for used marijuana. So I think it is a gateway drug, Kevin, it's a gateway to the White House. <laughs> They, okay, but I have a feeling there are plenty of other people who didn't reach their potential. Um, probably is um, that that did use a lot, and so it's a risk. It's a risk that you take, and the main reason, by the way, that my parents' generation is pretty much clueless when it comes to no offense to the baby boomers, but when it comes to marijuana is because what they smoked at Woodstock is like ditch week, basically, compared to what's going on now. 
two to three to four percent marijuana until the early 1980s. And people say, well, Kevin, what happened? What happened? Why are we, why do we have better pot? You know, in, in, in the 60s, you didn't want American grown pot. That was the worst. You wanted Mexican pot because it was cinsamia without seeds. That's what you wanted. Because you were smoking the leaves, actually, at that point. Which is hilarious to think about today, smoking the leaves. Because not the leaves, but it's the flowers now. And many other parts of the plant. And that, when you do that, and when we have frankly learned to be, you know, we're really good at things in America. Like I said, we're awesome at advertising and addicting a lot of people. We are really good at getting rich. We're also really good farmers, actually, it turns out. And we've learned these agricultural techniques, indoor, outdoor, <laughs> that increase the THC. Selective breeding is what it is. It's not quite genetic modification, but we're getting close. But it's selective breeding, which happens in farming. And we've been able to selectively breed marijuana, cannabis, the plant cannabis, in a way that increases the THC, it totally artificially increases the THC. Now, wouldn't normally happen without the intervention. And decrease things that actually might ironically have some medical value that used to be in cannabis from thousands of years ago, when we hear that this culture or that culture used it for medicine. We're not talking about the use of marijuana today. The use of marijuana actually pretty high in this other substance, which I'm going to get to later, called CBD. And let me tell you, there are hundreds of other components in marijuana. It actually is an exciting area of research. I mean, separate from this legalization discussion, on the medical side, it's a very exciting area of research. But I think the term medical marijuana is as wrong-headed as the term medical heroin. Why? Do we call morphine medical opium? Medical heroin? Because that's what it is. By the way, it's medical grade derivative of opium. What morphine is? Do we tell you to smoke opium also? You know, you know you're in a lot of pain. Forget the morphine with the dosage. And the, no, no. What you need to do is grow some poppy in your backyard and process it. Smoke the leaves. You're going to be good. You don't want big pharma. They're going to try and give you that drip. Grow it yourself. It's funny. But that's how we treat marijuana right now, for medical. It's amazing. So I'm not doubting when the cancer patient comes to me or the kid with 200 seizures, parents, comes to me and says, you know, Kevin, we tried a CBD oil and it was amazing. It really helped little Johnny. Or I, none of the anti-nausea medications worked for me and we tried a, a certain strain of marijuana, high in THC, and it really made me feel better. I, I don't doubt, I'm not saying those people are liars. But we're not doing it in the right way. Because as a public policy, that has turned into, I'm a 32-year-old with, with some lower back pain, give me a joint. Right? And it has also turned into a lot of confusion. So now you have the CNNs of the world saying, oh my god, medical marijuana is the best thing ever, and it's, it's the research. Do you think when people hear Sanjay Gupta say that, they think he's talking about cannabidiol? Or a special blend of marijuana that is equal parts cannabidiol and tetrahydrocannabinol? I don't think so. But when we see headlines like medical marijuana or Gupta changes mind on pot or whatever, it's, it's sloppy and it feeds into the confusion about this whole issue. So again, my point is the marijuana today is not the marijuana from Woodstock. And so a lot of parents say, my generation is doing just fine, Kevin. Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, and we're kind of, we're okay. You're saying that we're kind of this lost generation to we, we're, we're, what was that? No one's saying that they're a lost generation, but also that was not what they were smoking. It does not resemble today's marijuana at all. And I want to talk a little bit about the waxes that uh, the, the prosecutor mentioned. You know, uh, I got to tell you a story. I was speaking at a high school recently, uh, about a couple months ago, or maybe it was longer than that. Or six months ago, eight months ago. And the person introducing me, wonderful woman, vice president of the high school, mid-60s, she said, we're so excited to have Dr. Sabet here. He is going to talk. Remember, the audience were 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. He is going to be here to talk about that roach clip that gets passed around at your parties. <laughs> when she said roach clip, it was like, they thought I was going to be talking about a certain kind of insect extermination. <laughs> What, what the hell is a roach clip? It's something that you hold with... The joint is that... First of all, one kid said, wait a minute, you're saying that the joint is that small, it needs a holder, and then you pass it around for other people to use? 
What era is this? I mean, it was hilarious. Then the guy in the back raised his hand and said, is he going to talk about dabs? And the poor vice principal, did. she said, can you repeat that, please? Is he going to talk about dabs, dabbing? Is he talking about BHO, butane hash oil, dabbing, waxes, honey oil? Honey? She was like, she was speechless. She had no idea what, what he was talking about. Okay, and then I sort of intervened and it was a good intro to the talk. But that, to me, represented the huge disconnect in this country about, you know, what my parents might have experimented with and what Bill Clinton didn't inhale <laughs> versus uh, what is really actually happening today. Because let me tell you something, I don't know about you, I don't know, I mean, maybe you have some experts here, but um, when I see a brown waxy substance hanging on the edge of a needle, that kind of looks like something else. Um, I don't think in Cheech and Chong's wildest dreams could they imagine marijuana, 98% pure THC. You know, you can't smoke anything over around 35 to 40%, and that's the extreme high THC marijuana. It's a, it becomes unstable. You cannot put it in a joint and smoke that. Again, Cheech and Chong, I think, tried, but you can't. Um, notice, by the way, three quarters of the room had no idea who Cheech and Chong is. That's another part of unless you watch Dancing with the Stars. Uh, that was another, which again, generational disconnect. That's another issue here, is another example of the issue I'm talking about. But you know, I don't usually quote High Times Magazine. I know you're shocked at that, because it seems like I would want to quote High Times a lot, the astute journal that it is. But I gotta tell you, they really nailed it on the head here with this quote. I thought it was brilliant. What they said, because they were writing an article about, they told people, you know, calm down with the dabbing. You're giving pot a bad name. Can you please stop exploding buildings in the center of Denver, please? And be civilized and smoke your joint or vape with your e-cig and stop this wax crap? And then they said, why? They said, well, with dabs, your local action news team gets to do a marijuana story that shows crack pipe torches used on sticky heroin looking goo made from a process that blows up like meth labs. <laughs> That's kind of about right. And uh, which, again, I'm shocked I'm quoting High Times, but it's, it's a pretty amazing. Um, you know, I'm not going to have time to do, do all this. I don't even know how much time I have. Do I have 10 minutes even, or five? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Okay, I'll take 20. No, uh, well, uh, uh, but, but when you look at um, the issue of mental illness, and I you don't want to keep you know, talking about it earlier, but, and you look at the connection that the Swedish scientist team, uh, Anderson, found in 1987. <laughs> That was the first, whoops, this might be connected. And we don't, we don't know, and we need to do more research. That was 1987, and we've done a lot of research since then. And essentially what we're finding is, the more potent marijuana, the more often you smoke it, the more likely you are to A, have an acute psychotic episode, which you'll recover from. I mean, you'll, like, you might jump off of, uh, you might be like Levi Thumba, the African exchange student, by the way, who went to Colorado and ate an edible, didn't feel anything, so he ate another one, and then jumped off a building and died. But you might be like most people that just have a psychotic episode and spend a night in the ER. Sort of scary, not anything you'd wish on anybody, but you'll survive. Or you might, you might, it could trigger the long-term schizophrenia. Good luck with that one, by the way. Doesn't mean you can't recover from, but good luck if you know anybody or have had any family members with schizophrenia. And so this isn't meant to scare and to be scared. This is simply meant to say, this is what the data says. It says you increase your likelihood. It doesn't mean that you definitely will get it. It just means you're increasing your chances. And again, that is sometimes hard to get across to people because if they smoke a lot of pot and they don't have mental illness, or they don't think they do, then they say, well, that's a lie. That they're all lies. And then they you know, start a blog about how all the government's just lying about pot. And the reality is, is it won't affect everybody the same way. But when researchers look at a lot of people over a long amount of time, their risk goes up. It's your choice. But I don't think the average American even knows that the risk goes up. They're not even able to make an educated decision about what policies make sense. And instead, we're going 100 miles an hour on a freight train to legalization without having a proper discussion of pros and cons. And this, I would say, should be part of the discussion about cons. Um, you know, not to use another train analogy, but I was at a treatment center recently. It was not, not a, I mean, it was, it was sad, actually. I mean, there's a, there, I've been to many recovery centers, which are awesome, 
And um, this was just because there were a lot of parents, because it wasn't a great time. Anyway, the point was, I asked the treatment director, what are you seeing here? And they said, well, we see everything. Okay. And I said, well, tell me the difference between the marijuana and the heroin. And you've had people in here for a while now. And he said, actually, Kevin, they're in the exact same place right now, right? They're in a place of hopelessness. They're in a place of despair. They've, their families are destroyed they're, or upset. Their futures are hanging in the balance. And I said, well, what do you mean they're in the same place? I mean, let's be, heroin is not marijuana. Okay, let's be, how, how do you make this? He said, Kevin, um, and he, he's used the train analogy. And he said, you know, it's like taking the, ex when you're on heroin or cocaine or pills, you're on that express train to addiction, right? You're gonna be there quickly, probably. Right, if you're injecting heroin every day, it's probably going to happen. You're smoking marijuana every day or regularly for a number of years. You're on. You're going to the same place in terms of the despair and the hopelessness. But you're on the local train, <laughs> so you might be able to get off. You you get off the local train, you're fine. The other, but the problem with the local train—that's the good news of the local train. You can. It's easier to get off on the express, right? The express one makes a few stops. I've learned. I'm going to New York, <laughs> and got on the wrong train. Anyway, but. The local, you can get off and on, so it's kind of good. But the bad part of the local, and this ha does definitely happen to me, is that I think it's gonna take forever to get there. That destination is so far away, it's so unrealistic, but the next thing you know, you're there. And you're in the same place as the guy who got on it wherever and got the express train. Um, even if you're experiencing different things. And I thought that was very interesting, coming from a, from a treatment professional who's been looking dealing with this for 30 years. So I think that the gulf has never been greater. The science and what scientists know and the public's misunderstanding, especially about the harms. And I'm gonna skip a lot of the stuff on medical because I wanna talk about the industry. I do wanna say a couple of things about medical. I referred to it earlier. You know, we know that like opium, marijuana has medical properties. Okay, I'm not up here to say medical marijuana is a joke, get out of town. What I'm here to say is that it's complicated actually. Opium has medical properties. Again, we don't ask you to smoke opium to get the effect of morphine, like I said. We also shouldn't ask someone to smoke pot to get the effects, the positive effects that might be there. So all I'm saying is, let's do the research, let's put it into a medication that you can actually dose. Those of you who've ever smoked anything, you can't dose it. You can't, do can you imagine you went to a pharmacist, actually I want you to smoke four cigarettes. Well, how much, of what, there's no, you, you cannot dose burning leaves. It's really hard to do. But you can dose other things, and modern medicine has learned to do that. And we should do that. It's very simple. It's not such a, it's actually not that difficult. Now, I will say that less than 5% of people with medical cards have a, have cancer, HIV, glaucoma, multiple sclerosis. The vast majority have, in fact, the average user in California in a recent study, I don't know, you can tell me if it's different where you know that, but 32 year old white male, history of drug abuse, no history of a terminal illness, right? So this becomes an excuse, um, and I think it becomes abused. There are other drugs in development right now, we should support them. We should make sure they're affordable, so it's not big pharma, absolutely not. But we should make sure they're affordable, they combine the ingredients of marijuana in a sa much safer, nothing safe, but in a safer, non-smoked way. And we should absolutely promote that with people where it would make sense. But we shouldn't pretend that when we have a loose medical marijuana law, which I don't think is really the case in New Jersey, but in many other states it is, a very loose law, you're not gonna have effects in other states or among young people. And there's research right now that you can't see because for some reason it's a gray color, but in parentheses in terms of the peer-reviewed research that does show about diversion and other things like that. But I'm back to this. This is what I'm gonna be back harping about. Can we really trust big corporations not to go after really the most vulnerable? And that includes the young, but it includes other people too. Um, and I'm not sure we can. As I said before, the guys running this they, the guys leading, the reason we are even talking about legalization, folks, in any state, listen, people have been trying, Willie Nelson, the poor guy, he's been trying to legalize marijuana since 1965. <laughs> There's been a movement for a while. Normal, the group Normal, God bless them, they've been around since 69 or 70. It, it wasn't them. It wasn't Tommy Chong, even though he glorifies pot. It's guys that are my age that, you know, and some people do say this guy looks like me, I'm kind of offended by that, but anyway. So, uh, but it's guys like that 
that are leading the charge. They are the relevant ones funding, actually literally these guys just wrote a two million dollar check last week to the state of California. So it's not even like kind of this happened a year ago, this just happened last week, to put that on the ballot. And I get that some people can say, well, you know, we'll do it in a responsible way, but I don't trust the industry to go along with those very learned smart people. If they did, I might say, you know what, we have a big problem, fish to fry, with heroin, and, I, and by the way, I want to commend the work on naloxone, I want to commend the work on, um, uh, you know, making sure that folks have access to sterile equipment if they're addicted, and making sure they're referred to treatment, making sure we're not locking people up and using our incarceration system as a, a, a default, not only mental health system, but drug addiction systems. I want to commend the efforts of law enforcement, frankly, we're the, we're the, one of the first ones to come on board to all this. But I also want to be realistic about what legalization means. And by the way, if you think it stops at marijuana, please do your research. <laughs> please look, first of all, at where the real money is. You the money with Mexican cartels is with pot? American pot? They're not making money from American pot. They make about 20% of their revenue from that. They make their money from cocaine, heroin, human trafficking, internet crimes, identity theft. And now the third thing, by the way, added that one to their hat. Do you think that if we legalize marijuana, that they're gonna say, boy, we tried, but you know, we're gonna go become ice cream men now, goodbye. <laughs> no, they diversify into the other drugs. So, and by the way, this is what the argument that the, a lot of the people who want to legalize marijuana, they say, you know what, I really can't stop the marijuana. Because if we want to really go after the underground market, you know, and really put the drug dealers out of business, then we actually need to legalize everything else. Now, they're not saying that now. <laughs> oh, they're not saying that in California. They're certainly not saying that when they go write a check to California. This is all about free the weed. But let's be clear about what the agenda is. And you should do your research on the groups that are funding this. Absolutely don't take my word for it. Look and see who's funded every single initiative in the last 15 years. And so when I see guys, that it's guys like this and not guys like Willie Nelson or Tommy Chong, this is what worries me. Not those guys. Because they have the billion dollar business plan. They bragged to the Wall Street Journal March 14th, 2014 in the one-on-one -on -one Saturday interview. This guy bragged to the Washington Post, uh, Wall Street Journal saying that he wants to be the Philip Morris of pot. I mean, it's not even like hiding it, right? You think like there'd be some shame. None, zero. And that is, folks, what worries me because now, guess what you have in Colorado and Denver? You have the city council election. Guess who's running? Guess who's funding the people running? But I thought we were going to have a committee, Kevin, and we were going to have a nice little committee, and we were going to have the coalition there, the police and the county prosecutor and the professor and the addiction psychiatrist and the treatment guy, and we'll have a medical marijuana person because they're serving the cancer patients, and maybe one of these guys. And we were going to come up with labeling. We were going to come up with nice little things about so that we don't, you know, make sure that the gummy bears are, you know, this big instead of this big, and we're going to. Do and the reality is that that goes through. That, that gets forgotten about. And that was three years ago in Colorado, which might have well have been 300 years ago. And legalization is the status quo. And these are now the special interest guys that are in there to write the law so that they make their money. Because that's what happened. When these guys invest in something, when these guys get the co-founder of PayPal, which they just did, $70 million dedicate, um, what's it called, not dedication, pledge, which is the marijuana industry, those guys want their money back. Anybody ever see Shark Tank? <laughs> this is Shark I mean, and by the way, they literally had something called Shark Tank. I'm not, that's not even just an analogy. In Las Vegas, these guys literally had that. But that's what it's about. But my point of bringing that out wasn't even to bring up their Shark Tank. It was to bring up the fact that when you're an investor, you want your money back. Mr. Wonderful doesn't give his money to people who are going to throw it away. And so that, my friends, is really what this whole thing is about, and that's what I want to have this discussion about. I want to remind ourselves of the early days of big tobacco because we do have some, you know, not great history when it comes to addictive industries. I mean, folks, this is the biggest. They tell me, I don't know, my gra my grandmother on my mother on my wife's side was telling me he was famous. I don't know who he is, but anyway, right. And then uh, you have more doctors, more camels than any other cigarette. And my favorite, Dr. Batty's asthma cigarettes. <laughs> Folks, people got away with that for a really long time. And right now in Colorado, you know what they're getting away with? When Levi Thumba dies from the balcony and his aunt says, 
What happened? And they say, well, he didn't take the right amount of the edible. And they say, well, what's the right amount? Well, it's very clearly labeled on the, on the packaging. You should, you're supposed to eat one-eighth of a cookie every 30 minutes. Okay, I don't know about you, when there's one cookie in front of me, I want three. This is going to come a problem, so I moved to New Jersey, the diner culture, all that, not good for the fitness, but I want three. I don't want an eighth of one, like cutting it in eighths. And that's literally the answer. It's not like we're going to go back and see why we're going to work on this. No, it's, yeah, we're legal, so, so what? You want to do some about it? Why don't you run a campaign to look with that? <laughs> and when the um, when Luke Goodman kills himself two weeks ago, when he was in Colorado, after he had taken an edible, it had no effect on him. He waited he waited about five minutes. Then he took another one. Then then he took another one, and all hit him at the same time. By the way, if you're wondering why that happens, it's because when you eat something, the effect is not immediate. Very simple. When you smoke something, it is. Smoke something is a great way for the effect being immediate. Why do you think we have crack cocaine, folks? It's the same thing as cocaine powder. You just add a little baking soda and make it into a rock so you can smoke it. Hits your brain faster. That's why crack is good. Otherwise, we've had cocaine for 150 years. Smoking is good for that, right? So when you smoke something, it hits the brain fast. When you eat something, it doesn't. It's hanging out in your system for a little bit. And then it hits you. And it's also, also very hard to gauge where the THC is and these edibles and how much you're having and all that. At least with smoking, even though you don't want to smoke anything that's bad for your lungs, there's some kind of titrating to the dose. Like when you want to stop, you don't want the effect immediately, you stop if you can, right? With eating, you cannot. You eat the whole thing, it's in your system unless you vomit it out. And so when Luke Goodman killed himself after having zero, back, a zero history of mental illness or violence or anything, the, again, the answer was, well, the label wasn't clearly read. I mean, he didn't read the label. And the dosage is wrong for him, and you know, that was the problem. This is now what we're... So we have all the statistics in the world about Colorado, which I'm not going to bore you with, but that's the kind of stuff more frightening to me than 20 times more people being burned. That's frightening. Or the ER, the five-year-olds grabbing the gummy, gummy bear, THC, marijuana gummy bears. I mean, you have a gummy bear, your boyfriend lives a gummy bear out. Five-year-olds gonna eat it. Uh, more, more worrisome to me, actually, than those is this because th that's a symptom of the overall culture. The overall culture is this culture of a special industry, and this is now what we have, repeating what we have with, with tobacco. So I don't have time, I don't think, to go into all the stats, but um, I did want to just show a couple of things. Some of these edibles. Um, E-cigarettes, you know, the, this is not only a big tobacco analogy, analogy, I said, I said, this is not just an analogy. The tobacco industry is in it, for real. What are some ways? The third largest tobacco company in the world, Japan Tobacco, just bought the technology to PAX, which is one of the most popular e-cigarette devices. Why? Because they're going to make it so that you can vaporize tobacco as well as marijuana. And you won't know the difference. By the way, if you're a teacher and you think like you're going to know if your eighth graders are smoking marijuana, because in the old days they would hide in the bathroom and you'd smell it on them, good luck. They're going to be in class and it's going to look like a highlighter. It's going to be this. It's literally going to be, and it is a flash drive that plugs in and, and charges that way and then is vaporized, used. So we have the Japan tobacco. We have evidence that R.J. Reynolds, we have evidence that now they're called Altria, Philip Morris, that 30 years ago, when marijuana was almost legalized, by the way, marijuana was almost legalized in the mid-70s, if anybody remembers those, those days, right? The coming off of the culture wars and sick of people like Richard Nixon and others, there was a big movement to legalize, and actually it was almost endorsed by the president at that time, pretty much, and his drugs are. And during that time, the tobacco industry said, wow, and they, remember, this is their heyday, so they, so they had nothing to worry about. They said, this is our market, folks, and they literally said things. We have, they said, we have the marketing, we have the land to grow it, we have the distribution, we have the packaging, and the licensing. This is for us. This is another product for it. Now, now when they're asked, they're kind of more, well, we're not commenting on that right now. We don't have plans. But then you go to a website called Altria Cannabis, and you see that it's bought. By who? By Altria. By Philip Morris. Then you go to Altria Marijuana. 
And you see that it's bought by who? By Philip Morris. And then you ask, so why did you buy the websites? <laughs> well, it's a defensive move. We're worried that a marijuana company might come in and buy that. and want, Because everybody wants a URL called altriacannabis.com. So they can meet unless you, unless you are that brand, right? So the evidence is there. I think we're going to see it soon. Um, but right now, we don't have to wait because we have the industry acting like those guys used to. And that's why you see these magazine covers. That's why you see these vending machines. Uh, this was a store that I went into in Colorado. I, I just, if I have five minutes, I'll give a minute on this story. I walked in there and they said, um, hello, sir. Are you here medical or are you here for recreational? <laughs> I didn't think I'd look sick. I said, I don't, what, what are you? I, I literally said, I don't know, what should I be in? <laughs> she smiled and she said, well, it depends on how much time you have. It wasn't, it depends how sick you are. And I said, okay, well, why? Well, if you have half an hour, we're going to page the doctor. He'll be here in 10 minutes. He'll do an evaluation of you. The evaluation won't take too long, she said. Don't worry. And then you pay $200 for a medical card. Why would I do that if I can buy a recreational? I mean, it's legal, right? I mean, this is like, this is Colorado. Why would I, why would I want a medical card? Well, the dirty little secret she told me, which the prosecutor was mentioning earlier, well, the taxes on recreational happen to be something like, you know, 20 times more than the taxes on medical. It's like 27% versus the medical taxes, which are like, I don't know, I don't know what it's 8%, whatever it is, lower, basically. And I said, well, I don't really have time for that. Interesting note, I don't have time for that. I just want to buy, I wanted to buy some of the, I actually wanted to buy um, this gummy worms and the lollipops and the, the, the chocolate bar because I wanted to show it in some of these things that I do. Anyway, I said, I'd like to get a couple of them. I, I, yeah. And I, then she said, remember, we're cash only because the banks won't work with us. Okay. So I never carry cash. I happen to have $60 cash on me now because I'm learning to pay cash for gas in New Jersey. And I never had to do that before. So I have more cash in my wallet than normal. I had 80 bucks around. Okay. And um, she said, uh, anyway, she put it all together. I swear, it was like seven or eight items. Then she said, do you have your child-proof bag with you, sir? So I do not. Do I need to have that to? How responsible? Do I need to have that to buy? No, no, no. We'll sell it to you for four seventy-five. Okay. It was a white Ziploc. <laughs> anyway, she added it all up. It was something like two hundred and sixty-seven dollars. And I said, Well, I just find like seven little things. What do you mean? And it, with the tax, so I ended up, and I didn't even bring it today, so that goes to show you. But I ended up buying two things, and because it came to like sixty-nine fifty, with the tax in the bag. And then when we hear about why the black market is thriving, I think it's kind of obvious. Um, I just want to finish up uh, look so that you can see some of the things that I saw on the freeway. Um, some of the coupons, you know, the free dab. Folks, this is America at its best. Really, I mean, we are the, if you're, if you're in the toy business, you might manufacture your toys in China because they're cheaper, but you are definitely advertising your toys in the United States with a Madison Avenue PR company if you want to be successful. We are the masters at promotion, commercialization, and advertising. And that's what all of this is. So we use sex, we use anything to bring young people in. We use all kinds of words like health and wellness and love and, but all these kinds of things. Um, and um, we're, we're, this was, this took me five minutes, by the way. This was just looking through one publication. This wasn't like a careful, as you can see, I put it together quickly. Um, we use holidays. I mean, we, you know, we're, we're very good at it. So, I, you know, this really is my worry. Um, I'm going to end and show a, a two minute so can have the discussion. I have a lot of stats, which you can get on the SAM website as well as the Ida website. Um, I will say one more thing. That was the New York Times came out with their editorial against legal, uh, in favor of legalization. Do you guys see that last year? Right? They said, because of social justice, we need to legalize marijuana. Okay. By the way, they didn't consult with any medical societies, nor would they meet with Patrick or I months before this was coming out. We knew it was coming out. So, um, and that's fine. They did that. Imagine my, uh, sort of, what I was feeling when I opened the New York Times last week, if you saw it in the upshot page two. Marijuana taxes won't save state budgets. Shocker, right? Um, they finally came around to that, didn't change their mind, but th this is the reason why Americans vote for legalization, folks. It's not because everyone wants to smoke pot. 
It's mainly because they think it's money for schools. And again, you have alcohol and tobacco legal here. Okay, how, and gambling. How are the schools? You guys fully funded? In all counties, good to go? How about the alcohol treatment? Because that's what taxes is for, alcohol treatment. Everyone get treatment who needs it? Um, for every dollar in alcohol tax reality check, we spend 10 in social costs. So these kinds of things don't exactly pay for themselves. Um, I will say that out of the 31 cities in Colorado that voted for legalization, they, they voted again two years later to decide if they want a store. 26 of them decided they did not want a store in their, in their community. Which makes me think that I don't think legalization is inevitable. I don't think it's something that is definitely coming. It may take a while for people to realize what's going on. But it's really hard. It's even hard for marijuana users, I've asked, to tell me that their relationships, their community, their ability to learn, their ability to be a parent, their ability to be a driver, is better off because of marijuana. Sort of like the alcohol question I asked earlier. Are you better off? And when voters were asked that in Colorado, actually 26 out of 31 cities said we don't want a marijuana store in our own backyard. So that's the reason we started saying I'm not going to pitch it. You can, you can look us up there on the website. Um, I do want to show this two-minute video, and then I think we're going to be able to have our um, discussion uh, up if I can. We just, uh, Michael DeLeon, actually, from New Jersey, uh, put this together for you. Do you believe nicotine is not addictive? I believe nicotine is not addictive, yes. Mr. Johnson. Uh, Congressman, cigarettes and nicotine clearly do not meet the classic definitions of addiction. I don't believe that nicotine or our products are addictive. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. And I do believe that nicotine is not addictive.